I spent, I got to spend a year in, in Europe as a university professor. I got to take advantage of a sabbatical. I lived in, in Brussels for a year. I also, uh, on another sabbatical, lived in the Netherlands. And what I want to share with you is the perspective I got from there about congestion protection and priority for public transportation. Priority for public transportation <coughs> helps to break the vicious cycle that we have. This is a cycle that's especially strong any place where income is rising fast, such as in China, such as in a lot of Middle Eastern countries, that uh, as more people have money that they can uh, buy cars with, the streets become congested. When the streets become congested, well, transit becomes slower. When transit becomes slower, people say, to heck with transit, I'm buying a car. And it, the cycle keeps going. And congestion protection, keeping transit out of the congestion mess, helps to break that cycle. Helps make a difference so that uh, people uh, don't have to feel like that uh, only people without a choice use transit. When you have traffic that's slow and stuck and public transportation is zipping by, all of a sudden, hey, now public transit, that's, you know, that's what's moving fast. It's laying out the red carpet for public transportation. So in the United States, and, uh, and especially if you think about the Boston area, we do have priority for public transportation, but we have it at one extreme. We'll spend millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to build some metro lines. But we don't have you know, money to build metro line after metro line after metro line. At the other extreme, we have our buses and our streetcars just being waiting at traffic lights, stuck in transit. And if we would take that attitude of, of priority and congestion protection and along the whole spectrum and spend a little bit of money here, a little bit of money there, uh, spend some space, spend some traffic capacity to, to give our transit protection, we could have a system that attracts more people and has lower operating costs because the vehicles can be moving faster. So uh, let me tell you a little bit what I learned about Zurich, which is really a model of, tra of, of congestion protection. Europe um, uh, got full of autos at a much later date than us. 1950 in Europe, there were still very few cars around. 1960, still pr pretty few. Uh, and then car ownership started exploding. So Zurich was finding, okay, the streets are getting congested and so on, and the city father said it's time to build a subway, time to build a metro system. But the people voted, no, we don't want a metro. But that doesn't mean we're against public transportation. We believe there's another way that it's possible to have priority for, tr for public transportation without having to sink hundreds of millions into the ground. So let's try to do it with priority. And their system has had astonishing success. Uh, in, in Zurich, people actually don't have to look at their smartphones to see when the next tram is coming. Because they're scheduled to come every 3.75 minutes. And sometimes they're a quarter of a minute late. <laughs> Just like the 66. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, the Swiss people are rich, but the Swiss people living in Zurich own 50% fewer cars than other Swiss people, and they make 550 annual trips per capita. Okay? That's in in incredible. So what, what, how do they do it? So they have this combination of strategies. First of all, there are some global strategies to reduce congestion, and then uh, tactics for, for individual routes, con uh, congestion protection, traffic signal, uh, and so on. So let me, let me describe those and say something about how they might apply in Boston. First, there are these global strategies, because if the streets are drowning in congestion, well, it's really hard to get your buses and streetcars through. There's not much you can do other than put transit at a different level. Uh, so if you uh, can't always build a subway, uh, you got to figure out a way to keep your streets from being so crowded. And uh, wherever there's excess road capacity, of course, that makes uh, uh, transit priorities easier. 
So one thing Zurich did was they instituted a downtown parking freeze. Hey, Boston instituted a downtown parking freeze about 1970s. But Zurich's is a lot more <laughs> severe. You build a building in downtown Zurich and you say, I want to provide 30 parking spaces for, you know, VIPs, very important people. You have to go negotiate with the city. And, and the city will say, well, that's only, we can only do that if we take 30 on-street parking spaces out of commission and turn that into park space, turn it into bus lanes, no added parking in the downtown. Uh, major investment in commuter rail, and, com and that's, that's vital, and Boston really is a leader in that in, in, in the United States, because the people who are coming in by commuter rail, if they didn't have that option, think of how many more cars that would be coming in and flooding our streets. So we need to keep up the investment in commuter rail. They only allow offices, shopping malls, and other kinds of intensive development at transit hubs so that a lot of people can get to their places with transit. And this is a great trick they use, perimeter traffic metering. They put a, a, a cordon ar around the city, maybe five, five kilometer or five mile radi uh, radius around, and at all the traffic lights where traffic is coming in during the morning peak hour, they just dial down the green time a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just... Not that many cars can get in because we just don't hold the lights green that long. <laughs> and if you think that can't be done in America, there are cities in California, suburban cities in the Bay Area, where at the boundary between one city and another, that's exactly what they do. The city of X doesn't want too much traffic coming in from the city of Y <laughs> so that their streets won't be so congested. They do it. And you don't even have to have public meetings about that. You just do it. <laughs> uh, you know, there's no environmental impact statement for changing the green time. All right. Uh, they use physical pr congestion protection measures, the number one being bus lanes. Boston got its first bus lanes, other than a few that were downtown bus lanes, a few short, short, short blocks, uh, just a few years ago with the Silver Line. Uh, but bus lanes is the number one way of saying we want to give priority to transit. Let the cars be stuck in one lane and let the buses zip past in their own lane. Uh, also, uh, some barriers. Well, I, I won't get into the barriers. Um, in, in some cities that are too, uh, where, where bus lanes might be violated, to, to emphasize even more, stay out. They've made, mount, uh, they've made mountable barriers. So uh, the bus or the, and the trams are in the middle of the street. If a, if a fire truck needs to climb up, they can climb up, even if a regular car needs to climb up because somebody's double parked in the street. But it's a stronger way of saying, stay out. This is for transit only. Um, on one-way streets, here's a, a two-way tram lines in Dublin and that, that uh, give the, the, the light rail there hardly ever stops at a red light because they get priority the whole way through. Um, another, another thing to speed up our buses, and I know the MBTA is working on doing this, is where, where there are hot spots of, of local traffic congestion, get your bus stops out of those hot spots. This is an example in Coolidge Corner in Brookline where this is, this is Harvard Street. The current bus stop is right uh, at the stop line. And what that means is the buses often have to suffer what I call the triple stop. First, the bus arrives, and because the light is red, the bus has to stop about here because there's a, there's a queue at the traffic light. When the light turns green and cars start to go, the bus gets to advance too, but the bus has to stop to serve its passengers. And by the time the bus has finished serving its passengers, the light is red. So it stops again for a third time, and then finally on the green light it gets to go. So, Moving stops either far enough upstream where they're away from the congestion or uh, more commonly moving them to the, to the far side so the bus can get through that intersection as quickly as possible helps to uh, speed things up. Uh, other things that I saw there in, uh, in, in Zurich was a nice a road closure. They simply closed a block of this road, except the tram could go right through. Or in Brussels, here was a main street and there's a barrier right down the middle of this main street. And where the side street met the main street, cars could not go through the barrier, but the streetcar could. What that did was just took about just about all the traffic off of the street that the uh, streetcar was on. 
Um, contraflow bus lanes. So on a one-way street, when you say here's a, a, lane, a, a lane only for buses, most people won't drive in a lane. There might be a bus coming right at them. Now, there are some exceptions. The, the good people of, in, in Brussels told me, told me that uh, sometimes the taxi drivers would do that. So one day a taxi driver came up this lane and a bus came at him. And so the taxi driver figured, oh, okay, I got to back up. So the, the taxi would back up, you know, 100 feet. The bus driver stayed right on his nose. Mm -hmm. so, the, so the taxi just could not escape. Every, every, every time the bus, the taxi backed up, the bus stood right in front of him. So that taxi driver would never do that again. <laughs> um, all right, I'll skip some of these things. But uh, simply closing roads. You know, Zurich, as, as great as Zurich was, even the people of Zurich didn't believe it could happen that if they closed the street, it wouldn't cause chaos to traffic in other places. And then a wonderful thing happened. They had to close the street temporarily for construction. So it gave them an experiment. For a year, the street was closed. And doomsday didn't happen. So after that year, it was very easy to then win a vote and say, yeah, we just close down that street to cars. And so it's, it's been for, for pedestrians and, uh, and transit. Um, signal priority for transit is something that is pretty rare in this northeastern part of the country. It's common in some other parts of the country, and it is standard in Europe. Uh, it's, it's hard to understand how we could have, how the town of Brookline where I live, uh, that we could have had a $10 million project rebuilding the street, putting in a whole new traffic signal system. We have the green line running down the middle. And the only thing that wasn't part of that project was there's no priority for transit. So uh, a streetcar with 200 people can sit there waiting at a red light while three cars with one person each in them go. Um, so we, we need, a, we need a, a more positive attitude toward transit priority. Uh, there are, the standard tactics are early green, green extension, inserting a phase. Um, I won't go into those special tactics. And then here, here's a, 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 a transit priority tactic that I saw in a Dutch city, Eindhoven. Um, there was a bus lane, and at a certain point, the, the newer part of the city meets the older part of the city. And in the older part of the city, the road's too narrow, there isn't room for a bus lane. So the traffic people figured out that as long as the traffic on that street didn't exceed a certain amount, let's say 350 cars an hour, then traffic would move pretty well. But more than that, traffic would get all slow and the bus would be stuck. So they simply dialed down the green time at this place to not allow more than 350 cars or whatever the number was per hour to get in. I, I remember standing there and saying, the light is just red. And there's this long line of cars trying to get in. The light is just red. How can you do that? And then the light would turn green and let about five cars through, and then it would turn red again. And I said to my friend, how can you do that? And he said, we aren't Americans. <laughs> it's easy for us. <laughs> um, Zurich has a traffic signal control system that is suited to transit priority because it is inherently flexible and interruptible. It doesn't have, as American systems tend to, long signal cycles with clock-based coordination. So you can't interrupt it or it'll mess up the coordination. The Zurich system is flexible. It'll shape, it'll shape the coordination waves around their streetcars. And that's exactly the research that I'm working on with, uh, with a student of mine, Borak, who's, who's sitting back here. Um, and then finally, and I think this is really important, they, have, uh, they pay attention to measuring and continually improving their transit priority. The, in Brussels, the transit agency has, has a position called the Director of Network Development. And his job is to make, is to try to find ways for buses to be able to go faster and faster, as well as develop new routes. But he, he liaisons with the city to say, hey, my buses are getting stuck here. Come on, what can you do about that? We need to improve the network, add some bus lanes here, add some signal priority there. Um, there the, the city has a contract with the transit agency in which they give the transit agency a dollar incentive for good quality of service. And so the transit agency wants to meet those quality standards because then they'll get more money. 
Um, so the, and, uh, and they do an annual report of their 50 worst hotspots. So the transit agency is giving a report to the city every year and the whole public, here's where our buses are getting stuck. Here's where our buses are getting stuck. Here's where our buses are getting stuck. Because of course we have this, you know, the, the transit agency is one organization and the traffic agency is another. And in America, the, the typical attitude is, well, we allow the buses to use our street. Help yourself. What more do you want? <laughs> and the transit agency says, well, we don't control the streets. We don't control the traffic lights. We can't do much about it. And while the two aren't unfriendly to each other, uh, we can do a lot more to making the, uh, the, our, our traffic and street people treat transit as the priority that, uh, that they should. Um, so, I'll just conclude by saying as an example, one of my students did for a master's thesis a study of one of Boston's bus routes, Route 66, a very heavily used bus route, found these four hot spots. Uh, and his task was, can we apply these European kind of solutions to these hot spots so that uh, buses, to reduce bus delay, reduce the travel time, improve reliability. He came up with great solutions for all these hotspots. I don't think we have time to go into them, um, but uh, I'll, during the question and answer period, if anybody wants to know, maybe I'll, uh, I'll leave it for that. Okay? So, the, uh, just backing up, right now our, our uh, transit agency is in crisis, and in some ways the crisis is good. It forces us, because it forces us to think about how can we make our transit system more efficient. And a lot of times this is cast as a trade-off. Well, either you have to pay more or you have worse service. Priority for transit is something that is a win-win. It makes the, the operator, it makes the agency have to pay less for transit service because they can cycle their vehicles through faster and it makes service better for all of us. Who pays for it? We pay for it, we the public, in saying we want, we want our, our, our streets or public space, give that priority, give priority in that space to public transportation. And I hope that attitude will grow uh, in, the, in Boston and throughout the United States.